Today we're looking at using what we call this fundamental theorem of algebra to help us solve these polynomials. So let's uh, look at this here just to kind of summarize what we've been doing and what we're going to be doing here in a moment. We've been solving polynomials so far and when we've been doing that we have only been finding the real zeros, the real numbers. Uh, knowing that an nth degree polynomial will have at most n real zero. So if it's a fifth degree polynomial it will have one or two or three or four or five real numbers, real zeros, real solutions, in some combination with imaginary answers, and that's where we're heading now. We're going to expand our domain, our set of inputs, so that it also includes complex numbers. So that means our answers could be reals and imaginaries as well. So the implications of this is that if we have an nth degree polynomial, then that means it has precisely that many zeros. They could be reals, they could be imaginaries, or some combination of them, but we now know the exact number of solutions that it ought to have. When we were only working with the real solutions, well then we were only finding reals and maybe there were some we were not finding because those were the imaginary. So that's why that was listed as having at most n real zeros. But now we can say it has precisely that many zeros. So that'll give us a clue into how many solutions we ought to be finding. That idea comes from what we call the fundamental theorem of algebra. So this is, this is essentially it's saying the same thing. It's saying if you have a function and it is a polynomial of degree n, right? That's your largest exponent. So maybe it's a power of five, for example. Now that exponent has to be positive then that function has at least one zero in the complex number system. What that means is we can find them. We can find that one and we can find more because if they're complex numbers, we can find either reals, because reals are within the complex number system, or we can find imaginaries. Imaginaries are within the complex number system. So we're kind of using this concept in combination with the rational zero test, which is what we've used before. That's the, that's the test with the synthetic division. That's where you guess and check your possible zeros. And that can then help us to solve the polynomial. Now we've been doing this already. This is nothing new. We've been solving the polynomial, but now we can find both reals and imaginaries by hand. So we'll look at some examples here in a moment. Also, our answers are going to be formatted in this way. We're going to say write the answers as linear factors. So the linear factorization theorem just is a way of formatting your answer so that instead of the original function, you can write it as factors, right? Factors are things that are multiplied together. And where you see the letter C, that's just a placeholder for the zero, for the solution. As many as solutions as we happen to have, we'll have that many factors. So a quick example here, let's say for a moment that we solved our polynomial and we got zeros of maybe zero, maybe negative two, maybe positive three, right? These are all reals, no imaginaries here, but the concept is that you could write the function as a product of linear factors. So what we're doing is we're taking each of the zeros and we're just dropping them in right here. So the template is x minus that zero that we solved for. So x minus the value of zero or x minus the negative two turns that into a positive two or x minus three. So notice on each of these, you have a power of one. And that's why we call them linear. So those are the linear factors of that polynomial. So we'll be, we'll be formatting our answer in this way. Note that when we're solving for our solutions, when we're solving for the zeros, those answers can be real numbers, they can be complex, uh, they can even be repeated, right? We can have a multiplicity of our answers in some cases as well. So let's take a look at a few examples here. All right, find all of the zeros of the function and write the polynomial as a product of linear factors. All right, so here we go. Notice this is already factored for us. X squared is being multiplied to the X plus three, which is being multiplied to the X squared minus one. So this has already been factored for us. Take a look at all of the exponents. This is a power of two. Here you have a power of one. Here you have a power of two. So altogether, this is 
a fifth degree polynomial. If you add those up, two plus one plus two is a total of five powers. So we have a fifth degree polynomial, which means we should find five answers. We set the function equal to zero and we'll be solving for these in just a moment. One change here, this x squared has not been completely factored. We need to factor that as well. So you have an x times an x, and then here's your x plus three. And even this can be factored, that x squared minus 1, that's the difference of perfect squares. That can be factored into x plus 1 times x minus 1. So notice you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 factors. So each of these will be set equal to 0. Notice we'll have some multiplicity here. We get a result of negative 3. And then we'll get a result of both positive and negative negative 1. All right, so there are the zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's part A where they said find all the zeros. So part B is now saying write that polynomial as a product of linear factors. That's what that is. right? So we actually had that on an earlier step. So here it is. f of x equals x times x. Right, Because if you plug in the 0, just x minus 0 is just an x. Here you have your x plus 3, right? You take that negative 3, you drop it in, so it's x minus the negative 3. Take that negative 1, drop it in, you have an x plus 1, and then the x minus 1. So you should, should have five of those, and we do. So that's the product of linear factors. Here in part 2, again, look at those powers. Here you have an m minus 4. That's an exponent of 1, but notice there's two copies of them. So that's two powers. Here's another two powers, so that means we have a total of... Four. So that's a fourth degree polynomial. So if we set this equal to zero, and uh, what we're about to do here is separate each of these and solve. So you have m minus four quantity squared equals zero. You have the m squared plus three equals zero. Right, we need to solve each of our factors. Now in example number one, we had factored everything right up front. What if you don't? What if you're at this stage now and you're ready to solve for the variable? Normally we would take the square root of both sides to get rid of that power of 2. But I cannot take the square root of 0 and uh, I should say normally when we take the square root you always have a plus or a minus. But I can't have a positive 0 and a negative 0 so taking the square root doesn't help me. Remember you want to separate these into two separate factors. So m minus 4 equals 0 and m minus 4 equals 0. We did something very similar to that here in example 1 where we separated the x squared into x times x. So each factor got its own little mini equation. So again, we will have some multiplicity here. m equals 4 and m equals 4. Now in this case of m squared plus 3, move the 3 to the other side. That gives us an m squared equals a negative 3. So notice here we will take the square root of both sides because I can take the plus or minus of this result. Now that's an imaginary, of course, so we want to think of that as plus or minus root 3 times i. The square root of that negative 1 is the i that you see right there. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. That's what we were expecting. That's all part a. We found the zeros. Part B, now the product of linear factors, we have actually the variable is m, so f of m. So m minus 4 times another m minus 4 times, and now we'll drop in these. So we have m minus the root 3i and m plus the root 3i. So you have four total factors because we had four zeros because it's a fourth degree polynomial. Here in example three, I wanted to change it up a little bit so you can scratch out what's printed on the page. This is what I want to use here instead. We have x to the fourth. So it's still a fourth degree polynomial. I just changed the terms. Here we have a 6x cubed plus 10x squared plus 6x plus 9. So one, two, three, four, five terms. So again, notice we're going to find all the zeros and then write the polynomial as a product of linear factors. So again, those are the same two steps. They have a few extra parts, a part C and a part D. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's get started with this. So this is the kind of work we've done before, back in section 3. 
where we were using our either factoring or the synthetic division to find the zeros. Because it has five terms, I'm not factoring this. Instead, we're going to use the rational zero test. So the rational zero test is the one where we list the possible zeros, and then we guess and check using synthetic division. To do this, we take the factors of the constant term, so factors of 9, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 9, and we would divide that by the factors of the leading coefficient, which is just a 1, so nothing really happens when you divide by 1. So we have these six possibilities. So what we need to do is we need to test with our synthetic division. Uh, we're just going to guess and check. I'm going to start off by guessing a positive 3. Let's see what happens. So with a positive 3, here's my coefficients. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You can see the numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when we were using this, remember, we always wanted a remainder of 0. What's this last value going to be? Well, it's clearly it's not going to be 0 because these values keep getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, that's certainly not the 0 we're looking for. So that's a fail. We have to guess and check another one. So maybe we should test something different. What if we tested negative 3. Bingo, there it is. That's what we're looking for. So this is one of our solutions. Now the leading, de, uh, the leading term had a degree of 4, so it's a fourth degree polynomial. So we know we should find four total answers, but we only found one. That means we have to find three more. So we're going to take the results of that successful test, and you remember what we do? We check to see if it can factor, because if it factors, it's going to be a lot more efficient than continuing our guessing and checking with the synthetic division. So we're saying we removed a common factor of x. This is now what we have. We have not a fourth degree, but a third degree polynomial, so x cubed plus 3x squared plus 1x plus 3, right? So that's what we have. So now it does have four terms, which, su which suggests maybe we can factor by grouping. Can we remove a common factor and have an identical binomial as a result? So we factored an x squared out of the first two terms. Out of the third and the fourth, they have no common factor except a positive 1. So you still need to write down that positive 1 as a placeholder because we want the binomials to be identical. That's how you know it factors, and it does. So let's remove the common factor of x plus 3, and you have terms of x squared and positive 1 remaining, so that's the other factor. Yeah, it does factor. So when we set this equal to 0, we can now solve for our remaining three zeros. That's interesting. Look at that. We happen to have a multiplicity. So we have two zeros that are duplicates. Here we can take the square root of both sides because we will have a positive and negative version of that. So that turns into plus or minus i, right? The square root of negative 1 is replaced with the i. So here are the zeros. We have negative 3 and negative 3 and plus or minus i. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4. That matches the power of 4. So yes, we found them all. All of that is part a. Part b then is to write it as the product of linear factors. So our function is equal to x plus 3 times x plus 3 times x minus i times x plus i. It doesn't matter which of these are in which order because they're all being multiplied together. So it doesn't matter what comes first or second or third or fourth. But if we were to multiply them all together, it would turn us back into that original problem that we had. That's the core of what we're doing today. If we take a look at part C, it says use your factorization to determine the x-intercepts. Well, obviously, an imaginary number is not an x-intercept. Only the negative 3 is. So what we have here in part C is to realize that an x-intercept, we want to write that as an ordered pair, and because of the multiplicity, 
we really just have one location. So I have one x-intercept at negative 3. Even though we have two zeros, we have one x-intercept on our graph. And then part D says to use a graphing calculator to verify that the real zeros are the only x-intercepts that you see. In other words, type this into your graphing calculator and just check to make sure that this really is the only point you see on your graphing calculator that is the x-intercept. So it's a way to check your work. Now something very interesting is happening here, and it's a pattern, so we want to point out patterns. And I don't know if you picked up on it, but if you look at the examples we've seen so far here, number two and number three, notice that whenever we've had imaginary values, there have always been two of them. And it's not just coincidence, that's a true pattern. Uh, here you can see again, here we have some imaginary answers, and there are always two of them. It turns out that imaginary values always come in pairs. They are not identical pairs. They are what we call conjugate pairs. So conjugate means one is positive and one is negative. So in the above examples, the two complex zeros are conjugate pairs of each other. Complex zeros always occur in conjugate pairs, meaning not identical pairs, but conjugate pairs. So if a plus bi is one of the zeros, then a minus bi has to be its pair. So think about some of the possibilities. Let's say that we had a polynomial of degree 1. That would be a linear equation like this. If you were to graph that, it would be a slope of 1 with a y-intercept of 2, right? So it's just a straight line. That means you cross the x-axis in one location. That means it has one real x-intercept. That's one real 0. That means there are no imaginaries to be found because it's a degree of 1. There should only be one answer. You cannot possibly have zero reals and one imaginary answer because the line is always going to have a real answer. You won't have imaginary answers because imaginaries always have to come in pairs. You can't possibly have just one imaginary. So this is the only combination with a linear equation. So what if we had a quadratic? All right, so that's a power of two. That means we should have a total of two solutions. So kind of think of this box here as being uh, split up into a top half and a bottom half. You could have two real answers, which means you would have zero imaginaries to find. You could have no real answers, in which case you could have two imaginaries to find. Notice you cannot have one and one. You cannot have one real and one imaginary because imaginaries always come in pairs. You either have two of them or four of them or six of them or, or none of them. Let's just expand on this a little bit farther. What would this look like if we were to draw a picture? If I were to graph a quadratic, when might I encounter a situation where I have two reals or no reals? What would that look like? So here's a sketch of a quadratic. Let's say that I had x-intercepts at 1 and 3. So you could potentially have a quadratic that might look something like this. And yeah, so you have two real intercepts two real zeros, there would be no imaginaries that you would be solving when solving a problem. Whatever the function is, we could see graphically we could get two zeros. So what would our parabola have to be in order to get no reals? All right, so in a case like that, we've seen this with a vertical shift. Let's say we shift it up two spots like this. All right, so that would be x squared plus 2. It's your parabola, but with a vertical shift up to. Notice it doesn't cross the x-axis at all, so it has no real answers. But if you were to set this equal to 0 and solve, you would get some imaginaries. How many imaginaries? Two of them. So that's what we're looking at. What if we had a power of 3, a third-degree polynomial? Well, that means you could have three reals and no imaginaries, or one real and two imaginaries. That's the only possible combination of our solutions. Notice you cannot have two reals and one imaginary because imaginaries always have to come in pairs. You'll never find just one of them. Let's go one farther. What if we had a fourth degree polynomial? All right, you could have four reals and no imaginaries. You could have two reals and two imaginaries. That's what we saw up here in Example three, right? We had two reals and two imaginaries. Or you could have no real solutions and four imaginaries because you'd have two pairs, essentially. Right? We could keep going with x to the power of five and so on, but 
I hope that kind of gives you the idea. So we can use this concept to help us in a few problem types where we need to work with pairs of these complex numbers. And we're going to see that on the next page with example 4 and 5. So in example 4, uh, it says find a polynomial function with integer coefficients that has these as the zero. So you have a solution of 0 and 2 and 3 plus i. Notice that is a complex number. So it's not 3 comma i, it's 3 plus i. So these are your real solutions, right? We have two reals. And notice this is your imaginary number, your complex number. However, they only gave me one. Remember, they're always supposed to be in pairs. So they gave us one. We have to provide its conjugate pair. which will be 3 minus i. So we really have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4 solutions. That means it'll be a fourth degree polynomial. So we'll start by setting this up as the product of linear factors. So x minus 0, right? The template is, is x minus, and then you drop in the 0. So we plugged in the value of 0. Now we'll plug in the value of 2. Now we have to plug in the value of 3 plus i. Now wrap that in parentheses because you want to think of it like a binomial. And then x minus the 3 minus i. Again, wrap that in parentheses so that we can distribute the negative sign. And then also I'll take this x and distribute that to the polynomial. Excuse me, distribute that to the x minus 2. So we get x squared minus 2x in front. Keep that in parentheses because everything is being multiplied here. And here we have x minus 3 minus i being multiplied with x minus 3 plus i. So our goal is to multiply this all together. And you don't want to work from left to right. You want to start where the imaginaries are and multiply them together first. Because when you multiply imaginaries with imaginaries, they will turn into reals. And we'll see that here in a moment. In order to do this, we learned a pattern. We learned a shortcut. And what we'll do is we are going to regroup the x minus 3s because they're exactly the same. We'll call that the A. We'll regroup the I and call that the B. What we're looking at here is we're multiplying a very particular pattern where we have something in front minus the item in back, and the same binomial in front is now being added with that term in the back. Notice the pattern we're seeing here is an A minus B times an A plus B. What we're calling A is just a placeholder for the X minus 3. If you were to multiply those together, you would get a result of a squared minus b squared. So we're going to use that pattern here to multiply these two trinomials. So again, keep the parentheses because everything's being multiplied together. So in place of the a, we want the x minus 3. So it's an x minus 3 quantity squared. Then you have the minus sign. And in place of the b, you want the term in back, which is the i. So we're going to take that i and square it. So we still have to foil out this x minus 3. So we'll get an x squared minus 6x plus 9. So be very careful when you foil that out. It's not just x squared and 3 squared. It's x minus 3 times itself. So you get a trinomial as a result. There's the minus sign, and the i squared is replaced with a negative 1. So that means this will be a plus 1. We'll change that 9 to a, to a 10 because we're adding 1. All right, so we had quite a bit of work just to get from the setup to the point where we don't have any imaginary values. Now we can do a double distribution to get the polynomial. So x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, and so on. We'll work our way down the line here, distributing that x squared. Then I'll take this negative 2x and distribute it as well. So negative 2x times the x squared is a negative 2x cubed. Instead of writing one long line from left to right, I'm going to instead park it right underneath the x cubed. What I'm doing is I'm setting up these matching columns so I can... I'm essentially combining like terms. I'm organizing my terms as I'm doing the distribution as well. Negative 2x times a negative 6x is a positive 12x. Right? So those are my like terms. I'll be combining those in a moment. 
and then lastly a negative 20x. So you can see we're, we have a column for the x to the fourth, a column for the x cubed, a column for the x squared, and that's supposed to be an x squared there and there, and then a column for my power of x, x to the first power. So we add each column up and we end up with the result of x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 22x squared and minus 20x. So if that was a polynomial they gave us and they said, okay, solve it, we could work our way backwards and get, that, get those four zeros. So this is an instance where we need to know that idea that those complex numbers, those imaginary numbers, always come in pairs. Not identical pairs, but conjugate pairs. There's one other type of problem that also requires this knowledge, and that's what you see down here in example five. Use the given zero of 3i to find all the zeros of this. Okay, so yes, it does factor, but they're not asking us to solve it using any method we want. They're actually asking us to use this concept of these conjugate pairs to help us solve it. So here there's, they're being more specific in the manner in which we want to solve it. Notice it's a third degree polynomial, so we would expect three answers. So if you think about all of the solutions, all of the zeros, we have 3i as one of them. But wait a minute, they always come in pairs. So that means we also know that there's a negative 3i. So now we know two of the three zeros. So we're just trying to figure out what is the last possible zero. Could this be imaginary as well? No, because they always have to come in pairs. That means our final solution must be a real number. So we're looking for a real number. How do we do that if we're supposed to use an imaginary number to find a real number? Normally, we would use synthetic division, right? If you think about example three, we've always used synthetic division, but we've always done that because we've been testing real numbers. What if it's imaginary? Then I can't test it. I can't divide by an imaginary value. We need a different technique, and that's what we're, what we're learning about here. So step one, take the two zeros that you do have and multiply those factors together. So in other words, we're setting this up as the product of linear factors using the two factors we already have. So we have an x minus 3i being multiplied with an x plus 3i. Because we don't know what the third factor is, we're just using the two that we do have. Now foil these together, and you'll get an x squared. You'll get a positive 3ix. You'll get a negative 3ix. And then multiplying the last of each pair, you have a negative 9i squared. So you'll notice that those middle terms cancel out, and again we'll replace that i squared with a negative 1. So it looks like x squared plus 9. So notice we started off with an imaginary value, we used its pair, multiplied them together, now we don't have imaginaries anymore. Now we can use this to divide the problem. However, I still can't use synthetic division because this is a quadratic, which means we have to use long division. We don't use long division very much in this section to find our missing zeros, but this is an instance where it shows up. This is really the only instance where it shows up. Remember, we need a column for every descending power of x. So there's your x cubed, x squared, x to the power of 1, and constant term. So yes, we have every column represented. Let's ask ourselves, x squared times what would multiply to that x cubed? We want an x. We'll put it here in the column of x's. Distribute that x to the divisor. So x times x squared is x cubed. x times 9 is a positive 9x, but that doesn't go here. No, it goes in this column. And then we're going to subtract each of those. And then we bring down what's remaining. So we kind of skipped over that x squared. So that has to be brought down. The 9 has to be brought down. So now we have an x squared and a plus 9. So we compare the first terms. x squared times what is x squared? We need a constant term of positive 1. Take that 1, multiply it to the binomial, and you get x squared. And 1 times 9 is 9. And again, we're subtracting each of these columns. And you can see they both cancel out. The remainder is 0. There's nothing remaining which indicates it divided evenly. So this is the final factor. All right, so that's the final factor. That's the third and missing factor 
to the polynomial, which means you can always take your factors and set them equal to zero to solve for x. So there it is. That is the value of the final and missing real term. So here it is, all the zeros. We have a plus or minus 3i and then a negative 1. So those are the two instances where we need to understand that those imaginary values always come in pairs.